It was April 15th, 1847, and the U.S. sloop of war USS Jamestown was pulling into a foreign harbor. Owing to the tide, she had to be towed in by a steamship, in this case the packet steamer Sabrina. When she arrived, she was met at the dock by a deputation of citizens, including all parties in politics and all creeds and religions. Her arrival was considered to be so momentous that poems were written about it, songs were written about it. Just three days after her arrival, the ship's captain, Robert Bennett Forbes, was presented with a painting of the ship pulling up to the dock. It was an extraordinary welcome for a naval vessel in time of war. But the Jamestown was an ocean away from Mexico and far removed from America's war with its southern neighbor. Instead, it was, in the words of Reverend C.W. Waterston, a ship of war changed into an angel of mercy. And her extraordinary voyage would change the world. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The 1812 Caracas earthquake was a rare event where the ravages of nature coincided with the ravages of war. The quake, or rather quakes, struck northeastern Venezuela on Thursday, March 26th, Monday Thursday, in a nation in the throes of the Venezuelan War for Independence. Estimates vary, but at least thousands died. Caracas, the capital, lay in ruins, so much so that some suggested relocating it. The earthquake had a major effect on the war, played a central role in the fall of the first Venezuelan Republic. It also did what disasters do causing untold suffering. Owing to the destruction, earthquakes are usually followed by disease and starvation. On April 29th, the United States Congress passed a resolution proposed by Samuel Macon of South Carolina to purchase provisions to aid the victims of the Caracas earthquake. The U.S. sent five ships loaded with provisions to the coast of Venezuela to be distributed among the most indigent of its inhabitants. The aid, approximately $50,000 worth, is considered the first example of foreign disaster assistance by the U.S. government. The aid was not just unprecedented in U.S. history, it was an extraordinary act, given the United States was already embroiled in a dispute with Great Britain that would eventually lead to war the following June. But it didn't exactly become a habit. In fact, a simultaneous resolution to aid victims of famine on the island of Tenerife failed that same day. At the time, the United States, and in general governments of the world, considered disaster relief to be the purview of private assistance and charity. The idea that foreign disaster relief was not the role of government not only fit the political philosophy of American citizens, but also was a practical consideration for a U.S. government that was generally limited, small, and had little international footprint or organization. But international relief on behalf of private charities had a long history. Notably to the United States was the Irish Donation of 1676. King Philip's War, fought between 1675 and 1678, is considered to be the first of America's Indian Wars between indigenous and European colonists, although the colonists had indigenous allies. And the war today is often seen as a civil war within New England society. The war was destructive to both sides, although in the end far more to the indigenous people than to the colonists. Still, the colonies of New England faced unprecedented threat. More than half the towns and the colonies were attacked, and a dozen were destroyed. In the face of widespread dislocation amongst the colonists and their indigenous allies, a private relief effort was raised in Ireland. A History of the Military Company of the Massachusetts, published in 1895, explains, Some friends of Massachusetts in Ireland, acting as individuals and without any official authority, had solicited relief in that country, for such as were impoverished, distressed, and in necessity by the late war in America. The Reverend Nathaniel Mather of Dublin had secured donations amounting to nearly 1,000 pounds in value, contributed by diverse Christians in Ireland, and a shipload of provisions had been thankfully received by those rendered destitute by the war. The aid was eventually distributed to more than 600 families. It was an act of charity that would not be forgotten. What Americans usually call the Irish Potato Famine is simply called the Great Famine in Ireland, and at the time an Irish Gaelic phrase meaning the bad life. The famine would eventually kill as many as a million and compel a million more to emigrate. The ships that carried the immigrants were so crowded and disease-ridden that they were called coffin ships. Death and immigration due to the famine reduced the island's population by as much as a quarter. News of the famine started to reach the United States in the fall of 1845. Newspapers at the time seemed more concerned with how the failure of the potato crop would affect grain markets. In fact, some of the United States saw opportunity for American exports of corn to replace potatoes. 
but there were still hints about the magnitude of the impending crisis. A letter from Dublin, published in the New York Tribune in November, read, Help, oh help, ye who can! Fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, friends of humanity, children, of a common father, your brothers and sisters, are starving. While many Irish immigrants in America were sending money home to aid and relief, the crop seemed to thrive in the early summer of 1846, and concern subsided. But the blight struck again, and crops that had been green in June were withered by July. The potato crop failed almost entirely in Ireland in 1846. Father Theobald Matthew, who had gained fame as a temperance reformer, became a tireless advocate for the Irish during the famine years, exhorting the British government to act. He wrote in December, I have been in several parts of this wretched country, remote from and near to Cork. I am grieved to be obliged to inform you that the distress is universal, though the people are more destitute in some districts than in others. Where the rural population is dense and was accustomed to immigrate during the harvest to other parts of the empire, to reap corn and dig potatoes, no understanding can conceive, no tongue express, the misery that prevails. While Father Matthew was hoping for a robust response in Britain, the famine had drawn the attention of the United States. A bill calling for $500,000 in relief aid passed the Senate, but a similar bill in the House failed to reach the floor from committee. While there was clear sympathy for the suffering, Kentucky Senator Henry Clay said, No imagination can conceive, no tongue express, no brush paint, the horrors of the scene which are daily exhibited in Ireland. The opposition argued that suffering in Ireland was not a legitimate concern of the U.S. government. The view was apparently held by President Polk, who, despite a political motive to court the immigrant vote, argued that the federal government did not have the constitutional authority to serve charitable causes. He wrote in his journal, I have all the sympathy for the oppressed Irish and Scotch. A few days ago I contributed $50 for their relief. But my solemn conviction is that Congress possesses no power to use public money for any such purpose. Faced with the prospect of a presidential veto, the act never made it out of committee in the House. To some extent, this should not have been a surprise. The 1812 aid to Venezuela notwithstanding, not only was the U.S. a largely isolationist state, but the very idea of foreign aid was not accepted in the international community. Author Stephen Paleo explained in the Boston Globe in 2020, The entire concept of international charity existed neither in the moral consciousness nor as part of the political strategy of monarchs or elected leaders. But the concept did stand in the hearts of the American people. A relief committee in Boston petitioned Congress to fit out the Constitution, or two sloops of war, without their armaments, of course, and place them at the disposition of the committee. The subscriptions in flour, grain, and provisions would be sent to them as fast as they could be stowed away. People would send their barrel of flour, their bag of corn, or their hundred barrels, and these vessels, now lying useless and rotting at the yard, would go forth as popular heralds of mercy, at little expense to the donors. While unwilling to make an expenditure for aid, Congress passed an act to allow the use of two Navy warships, the sloop of war USS Jamestown and the frigate USS Macedonian, under civilian captains, to carry aid to Ireland. The act was supported even by those who opposed aid on constitutional grounds under the argument that it only entailed the use of government property and that the Constitution did not regulate the use of the Navy in the same way it did public funds. Still, the act represented the first time that U.S. naval vessels would be put in the hands of civilians for a private mission. Public meetings were held across the country appealing for charitable contributions for famine relief. Professor of History Harvey Strom of Sage College explained in a 1998 journal of the Illinois Historical Society, by publicly endorsing famine relief, the nation's major political leaders blessed and encouraged a nationwide campaign of voluntary philanthropy and provided the catalyst to motivate local business, civic, and financial leaders to join and lead the public's response to the famine in Ireland and Scotland. Massachusetts Senator Daniel Webster spoke to a public meeting in Washington, D.C. in February. A famine bringing want and distress on a great portion of a whole people is unprecedented in Christendom in this age. He called for action, saying, Our object is not ostentation or parade. It is not to utter the sounds of empty brass or tinkling cymbals, but to do a deed of effectual charity, and to do it promptly, that the objects of our compassion may hear tidings of kindness and of relief from across the ocean, before death shall terminate their sufferings. Assistance came from all over the nation, but Boston, at the time a major center for Irish immigration, was among the first to act. A relief committee headed by Boston Mayor Josiah Quincy Jr. raised $150,000, the equivalent of nearly $4.5 million in 2021 dollars. A 2018 article on the History Channel website noted the extent of the aid. 
Railroads agreed to ship produce to Boston for free. Wharf proprietors donated the use of their docks and newspapers at no charge, ran notices from Forbes seeking volunteer crew members. The children of Massachusetts donated pennies. Churches took up special collections, and newly arrived Irish immigrants bore sacks of flour and potatoes to the docks to feed relatives back in their homeland. USS Jamestown, 163 foot 6 inches long with a beam of 32 feet, had been commissioned in 1844. In 1857, Jamestown was moored at the Boston Navy Yard. The ship was placed in the care of 43-year-old Robert Bennett Forbes, an experienced sea captain who had been successful in the China trade. The ship was delivered to Forbes by the Navy, and loading began fittingly on St. Patrick's Day, carried out by, Captain Forbes said, the Laborers' Aid Society of Boston, composed principally, if not entirely, of poor Irishmen. There was a delay for weather, but by the 27th, Forbes reported that the ship was full, drawing nearly 20 feet and having with her stores about 8,000 barrels bulk of provisions, grain, meal, etc., etc., on board. The ship cast off on the 28th at 8.30 a.m., crewed by 49 volunteers. In his narrative on the voyage entitled The Voyage of the Jamestown on Her Errand of Mercy, Forbes quoted Boston minister R.C. Waterston referring to the Irish donation of 1676. It is an interesting fact that the people of Ireland nearly 200 years ago thus sent relief to our pilgrim fathers in the time of their need, and that what we have been doing for that famishing country is but a return for what their fathers did for our fathers. And the whole circumstance proves a verification of the scripture. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Jamestown made the crossing in just 15 days. When they arrived, they received the gratitude of the Irish people. A letter from the Council for the Irish Confederation read, The thanks we desire to extend to the citizens of Boston, who loaded your vessel with her freight of life, and to the government of the United States, who at the very time they're engaged in an important war, requiring a large naval force for its prosecution, with a generosity rare in the records of nations, dispatched one of their ships to the relief of a distant people, having no other claim upon them than that of common humanity. Forbes was presented with numerous poems and songs that the people of Cork had written to commemorate the occasion. One cheer more for America, who in our deep distress stretched forth to Ireland her right hand to cheer us and to bless. The arrival of Jamestown was just the beginning. American relief would continue to flow, eventually amounting to more than 9,900 tons of food donated by the people across the nation. To be sure, not everyone was as enthusiastic as Boston. The Macedonian was in New York, where anti-immigrant know-nothings were more common, and in the end, Forbes had to assist getting help from the Boston Relief Committee in order to fill the ship. There is still debate over the causes of the Great Famine, and especially the culpability of the government of the United Kingdom, but the American response, at a time when the nation itself was at war, and when nations generally didn't consider assistance to victims of disasters abroad to be in the national interest, was significant, if relatively small, against the broad scope of the famine. But the U.S.-Irish relief effort was more than a reaction to the events of the day. Paleo explains that the scope of the aid both shocked the world and changed it, advancing the notion that gestures of philanthropy and brotherhood, rather than signs of a nation's weakness, were displays of quiet strength and moral certitude. There are many reasons why Americans so broadly supported the Irish relief effort, included among them what Daniel Webster described as changes in communication which brought nations nearer in neighborhood to each other. Certainly the war played a role. The idea of a mission of mercy during an unpopular war seemed to resonate with the public, but by and large the attitude of the nation was summed up in an article in the Boston Pilot in May 1847. The relief thus nobly sent may be regarded as one of the proudest moments in American history. It speaks trumpet-tongued to the national benevolence. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.